Our chapel speaker today is Dr. Willie Peterson. He has a THM from Dallas Seminary and a D-Min in urban church planting from Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. His ministry experience has included serving as an associate minister at the Bear Street Baptist Church of Dallas, co-founder and associate pastor of Bible Way Bible Church, and senior pastor at Berean Baptist Church in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Peterson has also served as a seminar leader for Promise Keepers, an urban research planner for Urban Evangelical Mission, and he has had the opportunity to teach and preach in various places around the world. And we're delighted that he's here to share with us what God has put on his heart today. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Willie Peterson as our speaker? Thank you. My wife is out there somewhere. Stand up. Oh, here she is. This is one of the happiest students on campus. <laughs> Amen. It is a delight to be here this morning and to share the Word of God with you. I'd like to talk this morning in our time together about forgiveness. 59 seconds into the flight, a small flame emerged on the side of the rocket and quickly spread to the propellant tank and the strut that secured the booster. The liquid hydrogen ignited and the propellant tank ruptured. The solid booster then broke free of the strut and crashed into the booster, causing the unit to explode, killing all seven astronauts on board the Challenger. O-rings <laughs> that seal gaps between the segments of the solid rocket boosters were designed to flex compensating for the sudden increase of pressure created by the booster's ignition. But due to the unusual cold that day, the O-rings momentarily failed, allowing hot gases to leak. It was January 28, 1986. It was our worst space disaster in history. Question, is the American church at risk for a spiritual disaster similar to the tragic Challenger Space Shuttle crash? <coughs> Look with me at Genesis chapter 50 as we examine a conversation that went on between brothers. I'm going to read beginning with verse 15 from the New American Standard. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. <coughs> then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Verse 19. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. 
So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. It is my view of scripture that forgiveness is about the most difficult Christian discipline to practice. Church said, you're not convinced. <laughs> but some huge benefits come with forgiveness. No wonder several times in the gospels, Jesus attached what I refer to as a strategic significance to forgiving others. Remember what Jesus said about forgiveness in Mark eleven twenty-five. 25? Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive your transgressions. Now, it does not seem that the disciples understood the strategic significance attached to forgiving others. But they did understand just how difficult it is to forgive others. In fact, the disciples apparently discussed the subject of forgiveness among themselves because Peter, on behalf of the group, raised the question with Jesus in Matthew 18. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him. I've often wanted to know the rest of what Peter didn't say. And what else, Peter? We might conclude from the story related by Jesus that the point was about more than just forgiving. Jesus intended to underscore the consequences for being unwilling to forgive. Well, if the disciples understood how difficult it is to forgive others, that truth they shared in common with Joseph's brothers. According to Genesis 37, many years before, several decades ago, Joseph's brothers were guilty of selling him into slavery for 20 shekels of silver. Here in Genesis 50, they were in an unenviable position. That same Joseph, whom they were guilty of selling into slavery, was now Lord and Master over them. Looking back at verses 15 through 18 of the text that I read, we will see that forgiving is difficult. Joseph's brothers were right about human nature holding grudges. They were right about human nature paying back for all the wrong done against it. This reaction proves the principle that it is impossible to forgive others when all you're able to see is your hurt, is your wound. It's those who have hurt you. Do you hurt, do you nurse an unforgiving spirit? Are there injuries and wounds, wrongs you feel have been again, done against you? perhaps more than just against you as an individual, but you as your class, your group. You feel that you've been injured. Scripture says get rid of it. If you're nursing an unforgiving spirit, no matter who we are, no matter what it is, advice this morning from the text is get rid of it. Forgiving made easy. In verses 19 through 21, 
We see that forgiving others is made easy, however, when we know that God's purpose is to bless others through our suffering. You can, you can forgive others when you know your suffering in the purposes of God is for him through your suffering to bless others. Look at verse 19 again. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? I wonder if Joseph thought of that verse that says, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. Joseph said, when I have looked at my suffering, when I have looked at what you with evil motives did to me, I saw more than you and your evil intentions. My theology came together. And I saw God working a plan through my suffering. If you go back and you, 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 you trace the, the life of Joseph from the time he was sold into slavery, we begin to see a pattern. Again and again and again, Joseph is mistreated, Joseph is evilly treated, Joseph is wronged, and Joseph becomes a, a source, a means, an instrument of blessing to those who were the source of his pain. Joseph said, if I talk to God about this thing, I discover that there's purpose in what I'm going through. There's purpose in what I've been called to bear. There's purpose behind what is happening to me. Verse 21. So therefore, do not be afraid. Second time he said that. These, these guys had potentially ruined this man's life. And here is that great moment. They're scared out of their wits. The last thing we hear from Joseph is his attempt to speak kindness into the hearts of these individuals. Twice he says to them here, do not be afraid. He makes them a promise. I will provide for you. He could have said, I will continue to provide for you in, and your little ones. And the text says, so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph acknowledged both the evil intent of his brothers and the good intentions of God. As we do these biblical unity seminars around the country, as we talk to people about uh, encouraging interracial fellowship among believers, as we talk, about, talk to people about what it means to both uh, love God and to carry out the Great Commission, to do the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, we talk to people about that. Forgiveness is the greatest barrier that we run up against. And I keep being asked over and over about the relationship between forgiving and forgetting. I find nowhere in the text where it says, forget what somebody has done to you. 
just forgive it. I don't know that there's really uh, the kind of forgiveness the text calls for if we could forget it. Because part of what it means to forgive is to put ourselves in a position to have it happen again. Perhaps there may be some prudent exceptions that we need to provide for. Joseph acknowledged both the evil, evil intents, evil actions of his brothers, and the good that God had in mind. There's a lot that goes on in this, in the way the narrative is developed back in chapter 45. This didn't just begin here. Joseph said, you had one plan, but God had another. Joseph held no grudge against his brothers because he discovered the purpose of God in his suffering. Instead of a grudge, Joseph made a promise that he would commit himself to the needs of those who hurt him. We ask, so what? Two things. In my view, to this day, the American church remains deeply spiritually divided because of slavery. We live in a great time, though, to encourage working together to heal the spiritual wounds. There are times when it is difficult even to imagine that the black and white church or churches are members of the same body. To begin with, very few in the black church teach forgiveness toward the white church for its role in slavery. I've talked to the students. I know how through the years when we studied the Great Awakening and we, we raised questions about Jonathan Edwards owning slaves and, 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 and uh, Whitfield's owning slaves and it didn't even emancipate him when he died. He, he wills them to somebody. Joseph's full and complete forgiveness towards his brothers for selling him into slavery offers the black church an example of how to forgive the white church for its role in American slavery. Joseph's request, Joseph's forgiveness in the text, according to the text, Joseph's forgiveness was unrequested and it was unconditional. Joseph forgave his brothers for what they did to his life long before they concocted this story, which is probably not true, that Jacob probably didn't say before he died. Joseph provides an example of how the black church can forgive the white church for its role in American slavery. Back in the 70s, when I was first a seminary student, it used to hurt me so bad. I'd go back and I'd read the best Old Testament commentaries on Genesis. And I didn't like what I read there. But Joseph says, by his example, his forgiveness was full, it was complete, it was unrequested, and it was unconditional. Joseph understood his suffering was a process used by God to bless others through him. The question is, has the American black church discovered God's purpose for its suffering? Rest assured, God did not call blacks exclusively to reach their own, but to reach the world. As I tried to persuade young African-American seminary students 
to venture into some other parts of the world beside Africa. I go to Africa. I go to the Caribbean. I go to the black countries. But I have not found a place around this world, this globe, where anyone is more welcome than African Americans are. Eastern Europe, Russia, Korea, Japan, Brazil, Paraguay, India. God has not called you just to reach your own, but the world. A graduate a number of years ago from the seminary, Dr. Takumba Ediamo, wrote this. There is a myth out there that asserts that since the church in Africa is financially poor, there isn't anything it, ha it can offer the rest of the church worldwide. Although the church in Africa, he says, is poor, it has much to offer. And I would say ditto for the African-American church. Furthermore, number two, the white church as a whole has been hesitant to affirm God's calling upon the black church to be a blessing to the whole church. I sense that not a few whites believe blacks can only reach other blacks. If you think I jest, imagine this. Imagine the laughter if African American students coming up to graduation began talking about planting white churches. Yeah. In the winter issue of Kendrick Spirit, I, I commend you to read it. I was so excited when my wife brought it and asked me, have you seen this issue of Kendrick Spirit? There is a wonderful discussion between Dr. Tony Evans and Dr. Mark Bailey, president of the seminary, about this very issue of the strained relationships between blacks and white, especially between evangelicals. And I like to quote something that Dr. Bailey says that sent me applauding. Dr. Bailey says in part, we must come before God and before each other, confess that there have been cultural sins, there have been national sins, there have been group sins. There, these sins go back hundreds of years. While we were not living then, we identify with these sins and confess them because by confessing the sins of our forefathers, there's a purification and a refining for the present. When I study the text, and I've, I, I've labored over this Genesis passage for a lot of days, a long time. And I conclude Joseph's brothers never affirmed that God had blessed them through Joseph. Joseph's brothers were unprepared to learn from him. They were so blinded by their guilt that they were unable to see how God had used Joseph's suffering to bless them. So you know what? For them, the transaction, this forgiveness transaction, would remain incomplete. It would remain incomplete until they could affirm that God had blessed them through Joseph. That's why they're in a panic. For a number of chapters now, Joseph has been being kind to them. Joseph has been demonstrating his forgiveness to them. This is a unique time and opportunity to challenge the status quo by affirming God's calling upon the black church to be a blessing to the whole world. In our Navigator seminars, we promote interracial fellowship among believers. We call upon churches to challenge the status quo, which is voluntary segregation because voluntary segregation is hindering the work of the kingdom. The church today in America is a voluntarily racially segregated church, an inaccurate portrayal of the church. Together, we can dismantle this racial 
racially segregated church structure and replace it with a church that welcomes everyone. Let's establish a new model of intentional fellowship and mutual cooperation. Black and white Christians forming partnerships built around mutual kingdom interests and shared ministry strengths. I'd like to close with a story that I, I, I love to uh, reflect on this story. I see it as a metaphor for the black church. It happens over in 2 Kings chapter 5. There's this little girl who has been taken uh, a slave by foreign invaders. And the woman she works for is married to a man who is a highly celebrated and decorated captain in the military. But the text says, however, but he was a leper. And I can imagine if this were the, 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 the black church, this little girl would say, I wish that my master was back home and I could introduce him to my preacher. And you know what? Her word ended up causing an international incident. But because this little girl did not see herself limited by her slave circumstances. She saw herself as forgiving those who took her captive and talking to them about her God. This leper got his healing because Elijah sent him down to the Jordan for seven dips. This is a metaphor for the calling of God upon the black church to be a blessing to the whole world. In Jesus' name.